thank you so much for the invitation to be here and, and thank you to all of you who are listening in through various means. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of my fellow panelists. Um, in non-COVID times, as Adam mentioned earlier, I think this would be a celebratory day. Um, I live close to Trout Lake here in Vancouver where the uh, what was the National uh, Indigenous Day celebrations would happen. So normally I would be happily eating bannock in the park and watching drumming with my child, uh, but I am actually very happy to be here with all of you in this moment um, and having, having this virtual celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day. Before I continue, I do want to acknowledge that I am on the unceded and traditional homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As the descendant of migrants and settlers, I am grateful to the Coast Salish peoples who have cared for these lands and these waters for generations. This gratitude comes with a responsibility, of which we have recently had a stark reminder to bear witness to the pain that continues to unfold as a result of Canada's colonial structures, such as a residential school system. I want to acknowledge that the news of the last few weeks from uh, now a growing number of nations, but starting with Kamloops to, to Sowetmik territory, uh, has been devastating and that words seem insufficient, but also necessary. And I want to recognize the uh, attendant responsibility that the discovery, the confirmation of the graves that so many have talked about for so long, places on us non-Indigenous people and our public institutions to bear witness and to dismantle these harmful structures in large and small ways. As BC's Human Rights Commissioner, I am an independent officer of the legislature, much like the ombudsperson or the auditor, with the mandate to address the root causes of inequality, injustice, and discrimination in BC, including by promoting compliance with international human rights obligations. And I emphasize that my role is, is independent from government, and my job is much like being a watchdog for the provincial government to ensure compliance with international human rights, as well as just our systemic mandate, the inclusion of international law in the scope of our human rights work, makes my office unique among human rights commissions in the country. Key to this role as human rights commissioner is a focus on decolonization and on indigenous rights. And I'm honored to be here with you to mark this day. Um, and I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the state of indigenous rights here in BC. Indigenous people, as you've heard already uh, through some of the speakers continue to face significant inequality. We know that Indigenous people are far over overrepresented in jails and that, for example, Indigenous women are the fastest growing population of incarcerated people. In 2019-2020, Indigenous youth accounted for nearly 50% of all youth admitted to custody in BC. We know as well that the legacy of state interference with Indigenous families continues today in the overrepresentation of children in the child protection system. The National Inquiry, called the ongoing crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, a genocide of gendered and racialized violence. It is in this context that COVID-19 has amplified racial tensions and fueled hatred, extremism, and the rise of authoritarianism. The virus has exacerbated poverty, homelessness, hunger, mental illness, and domestic abuse. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has spread hate along with the virus, and we've witnessed an increase in violent acts um, against marginalized communities, particularly Asian Canadian and Indigenous communities. And although the impact of COVID itself on the basis of race and ethnicity is still largely unknown in BC due to a lack of data collection, not unknown elsewhere in the country, we do know that the impact on First Nations peoples has been significant, even here in BC. For example, First Nations people in the north of BC have confirmed COVID-19 cases at twice the rate of, of non-Indigenous people in that region. And that rate is two and a half times higher in the island health region. Rather than an indication of some kind of inherent vulnerability, these high numbers are a result of poverty, overcrowding, health inequities leading to comorbidities and a lack of resources in many communities. Committing to decolonization entails understanding the many ways in which colonial structures continue to be detrimental to the lives, well-being, and rights of Indigenous people. 
In my work, it also means using the tools available to us, such as the human rights system and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to continue the push for change. It is in this spirit, for example, that we're currently doing significant research on, significant, on systemic racism in policing and anticipate releasing a report with our recommendations in coming months. We've also been working for the past year to encourage all public institutions, in particularly the provincial government, to collect race-based and other disaggregated data to ensure that all public policy is based on real lived experiences, including anti-Indigenous racism. Doing the work of human rights uh, means feeling the weight of generations of pain and the responsibility to combat oppression and discrimination in all its forms. But in another way, doing human rights work, doing decolonizing work is a celebration of what's possible. And I think we have to believe in the power of what's possible. We have to draw on our, our relevant optimism if we can find it. To, to feel this work is worthwhile and to do it um, uh, with any impact. It's perhaps an, perhaps an overused quote at this point, but I love it anyway. Uh, Aaron Deddy Roy once said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. More recently, she said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with their past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portable, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of nations and indigenous organizations in recent months. And I was struck recently, actually in the week after the discovery of the bodies at Kamloops Residential School, um, we're meeting with one band, a council member talked about his hope for in this moment, for how the conversation was shifting, for how optimistic he was that settlers were finally waking up and wanting to learn more and that things were beginning to shift. And his comment was a reminder to me that hope can be a radical act in times like this that holding this optimism is not a matter of turning our faces away from inequities and injustices. It's not a matter of putting our head in the sand, but can be rather a, man, a means of facing them head on. It's a means of imagining our world anew. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here with all of you and I wish happy Indigenous, uh, National Indigenous Day, uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day, I'm sorry, uh, to all of you listening. Thank you, take care.